me medesimo in cresce andarmi tanto tra tante miserie ravolgendo perché volendo mai lasciare stare quelle parti di quelle che io acconciamente posso schifare dico che stando in questi termini la nostra città da abitatori quasi vota a divenne siccome io poi da persona degna di fede sentì che nella venerabile chiesa di Santa Maria Novella un martedì mattina, non essendovi quasi alcuna altra persona, uditi di divini uffici in abito lugubre, quale si fatta stagione si richiedea, si ritrovarono sette giovani donne, tutte l'una all'altra o per amistà, o per vicinanza, o per parentato congiunte, delle quali né una il ventiottesimo anno passata aveva, né era minore di diciotto, sabia ciascuna e di sangue nobile e bella di forma, ornata di costumi e di leggiadra onestà. <coughs> Delle quali la prima, quella che di più età era, Pampinea chiameremo, <ride> la seconda Fiammetta, uh, Filomena la terza, la quarta Emilia, Um, e appresso Lauretta, um, la sesta Meifile e l'ultima è Lissa, non senza cagione, numeremo. Mentre tra le donne erano così fatti i ragionamenti, ed ecco entrare nella chiesa tre giovani, non perciò. <ride> Tanto che meno di 25 anni fosse l'età di colui che più giovane era di loro. Mm. Né quali, né perversità di tempo, né perdita d'amici o di parenti, né paura di se medesimi aveva potuto d'amor che non, non che spegnere ma raffreddare. Dei quali l'uno era chiamato uh, Panfilo, Filostrato il secondo, uh, il terzo... Dioneo, eh, assai piacevole e costumato ciascuno, e andavano cercando per loro somma consolazione in tanta turbazione di cose di veder le loro donne, le quali per ventura tutte e tre erano tra le predette sette, come che dell'altre alcune ne fossero congiunte parenti da alcuni di loro. <clears throat> Ricciardo Minutolo loves the wife of Spilipello Siginotti, and upon learning how jealous she is, he makes her think that his own wife would be meeting with Filippello at the baths the next day, and thus persuades her to go there herself, after which she discovers that she had really been there with Ricciardo, although all along she thought she was with her husband. Elisa had nothing more to say, and after they had praised Zima's cleverness, the queen ordered Fiammetta to proceed with the next story. <gasps> Gladly, my lady, she replied, all smiles, and began as follows. Although our city is as rich in stories on every sort of topic as it is in everything else, I should like to leave it behind for a while and, like Elisa, rehearse a story about what happened in another part of the world. You will thus, at one and the same time, learn how to deal prudently with things that might happen and be entertained by those that already happen. In the most ancient city of Naples, which is perhaps as delightful as any other in Italy, if not actually more so, there once lived a noble young man named Ricciardo Minutolo, who was as renowned for his noble blood as he was celebrated for his immense fortune. And despite the fact that he had a charming, very pretty young wife, he fell for a lady who by common consent was far more beautiful than any other in Naples. Her name was Capella, and she was married to an equally noble young man. 
named Filippello Siginolfi, whom she, a model of virtue, loved and cherished more than anything else in the world. Although Ricciardo Minutolo was in love with this Catella and did everything anyone normally would to win the lady's favor and affection, he was unable, for all that, to satisfy his desires and was thus on the verge of despair. Even if he had known how to free himself from the bonds of love, he lacked the strength to do so. And yet, he could neither die nor see any reason to go on living. One day, while he was languishing away in this condition, it happened that certain female relatives of his began earnestly entreating him to renounce his passionate attachment. All his efforts were in vain. They argued. For the only thing Catella cared about was Filippello, and she was so jealous of him that she thought the very birds flying through the air were trying to whisk him away from her. As soon as he heard about Catella's jealousy, it suddenly occurred to Ricciardo that there was a way for him to obtain what he desired. And thus, he began pretending that, <coughs> since he despaired of his love for Catella, he had, as a result, transferred his affection to another lady. For her sake, he started going to tournaments and jousting and doing all those things he had once done for Catella. And it did not take him very long to convince almost everyone in Naples, including Catella, that he was madly in love, not with her, but with this other lady. Moreover, he persevered with this act until this opinion was so firmly rooted in everyone's mind that... Catella herself, not to mention many others, abandoned the reserve she used to display toward him because of his love for her, and started giving him the same affable, neighborly greeting whenever she ran into him that she gave to everyone else. Now, it just so happened that during one particular warm spell, many companies of ladies and gentlemen, according to the Neapolitan custom, went to the seashore and amused themselves and ate both dinner and supper. <laughs> Knowing that Catella had gone there with her company, Ricciardo, likewise, <laughs> took his and headed for the same place. Where he was welcomed by Catella and her lady friends. Although not before he had made them ask him repeatedly to join them and had acted as though he was not particularly interested in spending time with them. When the ladies, joined by Catalla, began teasing him about his new love. <laughs> he pretended to be profoundly offended, thus giving them plenty of material to work with. Eventually, many of them wandered off by themselves in one direction or another, as people do in such places, leaving only Catella and a few of her friends behind with Ricciardo. Who proceeded to toss off a witty quip in her direction about a certain love affair her husband Filippello was having. This instantly provoked a jealous fit in her, and she was soon burning up with desire to know what Ricciardo was talking about. For a while, she managed to restrain herself. But in the end, incapable of controlling her feelings any longer, she begged Ricciardo, in the name of that lady whom he loved beyond all others, to, to be so good as to clarify what he had said about Filippello. Since you've implored me in the name of that person, I dare not refuse anything you ask of me. Therefore, I am prepared to tell you all about it. But you must promise me that you will never utter a single word either to him or to anyone else until you have actually proven that what I'm about to tell you is true. And whenever you'd like, I can actually show you how to do that. The lady accepted his offer, which made her believe all the more that he was telling the truth, and then swore that she would never say a word about it. They then went off to the side so that the others would not hear them. 
My lady, he said, if I were still in love with you the way I used to be, I would not have dared to tell you something that I thought might distress you. But since that love is now in the past, I have fewer misgivings about revealing the entire truth to you. I don't know whether Filippello ever took offense at the love I bore you, or whether he believed you returned it. But whatever the case may be, he never showed any sign of such feeling to me personally. Now, however, having waited perhaps for a time when he thought I would be less suspicious, he seems to be intent on doing to me what I'm afraid he fears I was doing to him. That is, having an affair with my wife. From what I have discovered, he has been courting her for quite some time now, with the utmost secrecy, sending her messages, all of which she's shown to me, and has been replying to them in accordance with my instructions. But just this morning, before I came here, I found a woman in my house having a private conversation with my wife. And immediately recognizing her for what she was, I called my wife and asked her what the woman wanted. It's that past Filippello, she replied. He keeps bothering me because he wants to know once and for all what my intentions are. And he tells me that if I want to do it, he could make arrangements for us to meet at one of the bathhouses in the city. Now, if it were for the fact that you forced me to continue negotiating with him, with him, and I have no idea why you did that, I would have gotten rid of him in such a way that he would mm. never look in my direction again. That's when I felt the guy was going too far and was no longer to be put up with. And it seemed to me that I should tell you about it so that you could see how he rewards you for that unwavering fidelity of yours that, at one time, was almost the death of me. And to convince you that this is not just a lot of idle talk and gossip, and to let you see it clearly. And indeed, touch it, if you want to. I had my wife tell the woman, who was waiting there for her response, that she was ready to go to the baths tomorrow around nuns when everybody's asleep. The woman then left, quite pleased with the arrangement. Now, I trust you don't believe I'd actually send my wife to the bathhouse, but if I were in your place, I'd arrange to find me there instead of the woman he's expecting to meet. And after I'd spent some time with him, I would show him just who it was he'd been with, and then I would give him precisely the kind of honorable treatment he deserves for what he did. Now, if you take my advice, I truly do believe that he'd be put to such shame that at a single stroke, we'd both be avenged for the injuries trying to do to us. As is the way with jealous people, <laughs> Catella did not pause to consider who the speaker was or whether he might be deceiving her, but believed every word the moment she heard it. As she began connecting the story he was telling her with certain events that had happened in the past, she suddenly flared up in anger and declared that she would definitely do what he suggested, since it would not take much of an effort on her part. Furthermore, she insisted that if Filippello really did show up there, she would not fail to make him feel so ashamed of himself that he would never look at another woman without having this experience buzzing about in his brain. Ricciardo was pleased with her reaction. And seeing as how he was making good progress with his plan, he said a great many other things to firm up her belief in his story, at the same time as begging her never to utter to anyone that she had heard it all from him. In response, she swore on her faith that she would never do so. The next morning, Ricciardo went to the good woman who ran the bath house explained what he wanted to do, and asked her to give him as much assistance as she could. Since the good woman was very much in his debt, she said she would be happy to help him, and she arranged with him what she was supposed to say and do. In the house where the baths were located, there was a room which was very dark, there being no window one could open to let in the light. 
following Ricardo's instructions, the young woman prepared the room. and had the best bed available set up there. Where, after he had eaten, Ricciardo stretched out <laughs> and started waiting for Catella to arrive. The lady had returned home the previous evening, seething with anger because of the story Ricciardo had told her to which she had given much more credence than she should have. As chance would have it, when Filippella turned up a little later, he was preoccupied with other thoughts and did not treat her with his usual show of affection. His behavior thus made Catella even more suspicious than she had been before, and she said to herself, he's clearly thinking about that other woman and about all the fun and games he'll be having with her tomorrow. Well, there's no way that's going to happen. And that thought, plus imagining what she would say to him after their encounter the next day, kept her awake for most of the night. But what more is there to say? When nuns arrived, Catella fetched her maid, and without giving the matter another thought, she went to the baths that Ricciardo had told her about. Finding the good woman there. She asked her if uh, Filippello had come around that day. And she replied, as she was supposed to. Are you the woman who's supposed to meet him here and speak with him? Yes, I Let am, replied Catella. Go right on in. He's waiting for you there. In pursuit of something she would have been happy not to find, the heavily veiled Catella had the woman take her to the room. where Ricciardo was waiting. And then locked the door behind her once she had gone inside. The moment he saw her enter, Ricciardo joyfully got to his feet. Took her in his arms and whispered, Welcome, my darling. Eager to convince him that she was the other woman, Catella kissed and hugged him made a great fuss over him, although all along she refrained from uttering a single word for fear that he would recognize her if she spoke. The room was exceptionally dark, a circumstance which pleased both parties. So dark, in fact, that, that it was impossible for them, even after they had been there a while, to see anything clearly at all. Richardo led her up onto the bed, where they remained for quite some time, <laughs> never saying a single thing, lest their voices give them away. Although one of them found the experience a lot more pleasant and enjoyable than the other one did. Finally, however, Catella thought it was time to reveal her pent-up indignation. And blazing with passionate anger, she began speaking. Ah, how wretched is the fate of women, and how misplaced the love that many of them bear their husbands. Poor me, for eight years now, I've loved you more than my very life. And you, I've now found out you are all on fire, burning up with love for another woman. What a base, evil man you are. Who is it that you think you've just been with? You've been with the woman you've been deceiving for ever so long with your phony expressions of affections, pretending you loved her, while all the time you were in love with someone else. You faithless traitor. I'm not Ricciardo's wife. I'm Catella. Just listen to my voice and you'll see who I really am. Oh, how I want to be out in the light again. It seems as 
as if it'll be a thousand years before I can give you the shame you deserve, you filthy, disgusting dog. Oh, poor me. For whom have I borne so much love for so many years? For this unfaithful dog who, who believes he's got some other woman in his arms and has lavished more caresses and, and loving affection on me in the little while I've spent with him here than in all the rest of the time I've been his wife. <laughs> you sharp and good and lusty today, you renegade dog, uh, as opposed to the way you are at home, where you're always so feeble and, and worn out and incapable of keeping it up. Oh, well, <laughs> thanks to God, the waters run downhill in the proper direction. Did you, did you think you could carry out your infidelity in secret? Well, by God, you didn't succeed, because you're not the only one who knows a thing or two, and I've had better hounds on your tail than you thought. Ricciardo was inwardly relishing these words, but instead of saying anything in response, he hugged her and kissed her, caressing her even more passionately than he had before, which only led her to continue her tirade. Oh, yes, she said. No, you think you'll calm me down with your phony caresses, you disgusting dog. Well, if you think you can pacify me and console me like that, you're wrong. I'll, I'll never be consoled for what you did until I've shamed you in front of our entire family, as well as every last one of our friends and neighbors. Am I not as beautiful as Ricciardo Minutolo's wife, you evil man? Am I not as much a lady? Why don't you answer me, you dirty dog? What's she got that I don't? Get away from me and keep your hands to yourself. You've done more than enough jousting for today. I am well aware that since you know who I am, from now on, you could use force to have your way with me. But with God's grace, I'll see to it that you go hungry. In fact, I don't know what's keeping me from sending for Ricciardo, who has loved me more than his very life, although he could never boast that I gave him so much as a single look. Nor can I see any reason why it would be wrong for me to do that, because after all, you thought you were having his wife here, and it's all just the same to you as if you did, since you didn't succeed for lack of trying. So, if I had him, you would have no right to hold it against me. Now, there were many, many more words. And the ladies' complaints went on and on. <laughs> but in the end, thinking how much trouble might ensue, if you let her go away believing what she did, Ricciardo decided to free her from the delusion she labored under by revealing who he was. Therefore, he took her in his arms and held her so tightly that she could not escape. My sweet soul, don't be upset, he said. What I was unable to achieve simply by loving you, love himself has taught me to obtain by means of deception. I am none other than your Ricciardo. As soon as she heard this and recognized his voice, Catale immediately tried to jump out of bed. Ricciardo prevented her from doing so, however. And then when she attempted to scream, he covered her mouth with one of his hands. My lady, he said, it is impossible to undo what's been done, even if you were to go on screaming for the rest of your life. Moreover, if you do that, or if you do anything else to reveal this to anyone, two things are going to happen. The first, which will cause you more than a little concern, is that your honor and good name will be ruined. Because no matter how much you insist that I tricked you into coming here, I shall respond that it's not true. Indeed, I shall maintain that I persuaded you to come here by promising you money and gifts. And then you're just saying all these things and making all this fuss because you got angry when I didn't give you as much as you were expecting. Now, you know that people have a tendency of believing the worst rather than the best about others, which is why my version of what happened will be just as believable as yours. In the second place, your husband and I will become mortal enemies. And it could just as well reach the point where he would be killed by me, 
as I would by him. And in either case, you would be miserably unhappy for the rest of your life. Therefore, heart of my heart, <laughs> do not seek at once at the same time to bring dishonor upon yourself and to place your husband and I in danger by placing us at odds. You are not the first woman that's ever been deceived, nor will you be the last. And in any case, I did not deceive you in order to deprive you of anything, but because of the overwhelming love that I feel for you. Indeed, I am prepared to love you and remain your humble servant forever. For a long time now, I and my possessions have been yours, and my power and all my influence have been at your service. But from now on, they will be, more than ever, yours to command. You are a wise woman, and I am certain that you will show the same good sense in this case as you have in others. Well, the child that was talking, Catella wept bitterly, but although she was very upset, and complained a great deal. Nevertheless, her reason admitted that there was some truth in Richardo's words, and, and it dawned on her that what he was talking about really could happen. Consequently, she declared, Richardo, I don't know how the Lord God can ever <coughs> give me the strength to bear the injury you've done me or the deceit you practiced here. Although I have no intention of making an outcry in this place to which my own simple-mindedness and excessive jealousy have led me, you may rest assured I won't be happy until I see myself revenged in some way or other for what you did to me. Now, let me go and get out of here. Since you've got what you wanted and tortured me to your heart's content, the time has come to release me. And so I'm begging you, please, let me go. Seeing just how disturbed she was, Richardo, who was determined not to leave until she forgave him, set about the task of appeasing her, using the sweetest words he could think of. And he said so much, and pleaded so much, and begged so much, that in the end, she surrendered and made peace with him. After that, by mutual consent, they stayed there a good long time together, enjoying themselves enormously. Now that the lady knew how much tastier the kisses of her lover were, and those of her husband. All of her harshness toward Ricciardo was transformed into sweet affection, and she loved him from that day forward with the greatest tenderness in the world. Moreover, since the two of them always acted with the utmost discretion, they were able to enjoy that love of theirs time and time again. And may all of us, and may God grant us to enjoy ours as well. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Ludovico reveals to Madonna Beatrice how much he loves her. She persuades her husband, Egano, to dress up like her and sends him out into the garden. She then sleeps with Ludovico, who gets up afterward, goes into the garden, and gives Egano a beating. Everyone marvels at Madonna Isabella's astuteness, as described by Pampinea. 
But then the king asked Philomena to follow her, and she said, Dear ladies, unless I am mistaken, I think I have an equally funny story to tell you, and in short order. Mm. You should know that there once lived in Paris a noble Florentine who had become a, a merchant because of his poverty, but had been so successful with his business that had managed to acquire a vast fortune. His wife had borne him only a single son, whom he had named Ludovico. To ensure he would be more inclined to grow up as a nobleman like his father rather than a merchant, the latter decided against placing him in a commercial establishment and instead, he arranged for him to join other noblemen in the service of the French king. Where he acquired a great deal in the way of good manners and refinement while he was living there. A, a group, group of knights who had just returned from the Holy Sepulchre happened to come in upon a discussion he was having with several other young men about the fair ladies to be found in France, England, and other parts of the world. And after listening to it for a while, one of the knights began to argue that of all the women he had seen in the many places he visited, he never found one that could match the beauty of Madonna Beatrice, the wife of Egano de Galluzzi de Bologna. And all of his companions after this judgment, who had been with him in Bologna and had seen her, concurred. <laughs> uh, Ludovico had not yet fallen in love with anyone, but as he listened to what the knight was saying, he became inflamed with such powerful desire to see the lady that the, he could think of nothing else. Fully intent upon going all the way to Bologna in order to see her and to stay there for a while, if he did indeed find her attractive, he gave his father to understand that he wanted to go to to the Holy Sepulchre. Mm. And it was only with the most great difficulty that he finally obtained his permission. <laughs> Having assumed the name of Arichino, he finally arrived in Bologna. And as luck would have it, the very next day, he caught sight of the lady at the banquet, finding her even more beautiful than he had imagined. He fell head over heels for her and resolved that he would never leave Bologna until he had won her love. He resolved that he considered a variety of ways to achieve what he wanted, but rejected all except one of them, concluding that he might just have a chance of getting what he wanted if he could find service with her husband, who had a large household staff. <laughs> he therefore <laughs> sold his horses and made suitable arrangements for the servants to be taken care of, having first ordered them to act as if they didn't know who he was, after which he got on friendly terms with his innkeeper and, and told him that he would like, uh, if it were possible, uh, to enter the service of some well-respected nobleman. To this, the innkeeper replied, you're precisely the kind of person who would suit to a nobleman in this city named Egano. He has a house full of servants and he wants every last one to be as presentable as you are. I'll talk to him about it. <laughs> the innkeeper was as good as his word. And by the time he had taken his leave of Egano, he had managed to place Anikino with him. <laughs> we suited Anikino to a tea. Now that he was living with Egano, and had ample opportunities to see the lady on more than one occasion. Anikino proceeded to serve his master so well and earn such a place in his esteem that Egano could do nothing without him and wound up placing himself and all his affairs under Anikino's control. 
One day, when Egano had gone out hawking and left Anikino behind, Madonna Beatrice happened to engage him in a game of chess! Chess! <laughs> Up to that point, she still had no knowledge of Anikino's love for her. Although she had often observed him and his manners, and being highly pleased with them, had come to admire what she saw. <laughs> Wishing to make her happy, Anikino very cleverly contrived <laughs> to let her win. We thrilled her to no end. But then, after all of her ladies in waiting who had been watching the game had gone out, out. and left them to play alone, Anikino heaved an immense sigh. Staring at him, the lady asked, What's the matter, Anikino? Does it, does it grieve you so much that I am winning? Uh, my lady said, Anikino, I'm, I'm sighing about something far more significant than that. Well, if you have any regard for me, tell me what it is, she said. When he heard the lady qualifier in treaty with, if you have any regard for me, Anikino, who loved her more than anything else in the world, heaved another sigh, even greater than the first. Which made the lady ask him all over again if he would please tell her the reason why. Uh, my lady, said Anikino, I'm terribly afraid that you'll be offended if I tell you what it is. And what's more, I'm worried that you might repeat it to someone else. I shall certainly not let it upset me, she said. And you may rest assured that no matter what you say to me, I'll never utter a word about it to anyone else against your wishes. <laughs> <laughs> Since I have your promise, said Anikino, I'll tell you what it is. Scarcely able to keep his eyes from brimming over with tears, Anikino told her who he was, what he had heard about her, where and how he had fallen in love with her, and why he had, he had entered her, her husband's service. Then he humbly asked her if there were any way she might take pity on him and, and gratify the secret desire that burned so fervently with him. Or if she were willing to do, to do this, he begged her to allow him to continue in his present position and, and to be content that he should go on loving her. Oh, how singularly sweet is the blood of Bologna. How praiseworthy have you always proved in cases like this. You never crave tears or sighs, but you have always been responsive to prayers and yielded to lovers' desires. If I could find worthy words to commend you, as you deserve, I would never grow tired of singing your praises. While Anikino spoke, the gentlewoman watched him closely, and as she believed everything he was saying without question, his prayers managed to impress the love he felt for her so forcefully upon her heart that she too began to sigh. <laughs> After having done so several times, she replied, Oh, my sweet Anikino, don't be discouraged. I have been pursued by many men, and I still am to this day, but neither gifts nor promises nor the courtship of gentlemen or lords was ever able to move my heart enough to make me love a single one of them. But in the brief space of time, it took you to utter these words. You made me feel that I belong to you far more than to myself. 
I consider that you have well and truly won my love, and I will give it to you, and promise that before this night is over, it will be yours to enjoy. In order to bring this about, come to my bedroom around midnight. I'll leave the door to the bedroom open, and since you know which side of the bed I sleep on, make your way over to me there, and I'll provide you with the consolation you have so long desired. In order to make you believe this, let me give you this kiss as my pledge. And with that, throwing her arms around his neck, she gave him a passionate kiss, and he replied in kind. <laughs> Their conversation thus ended, and Anikino left her and went off to, to attend to certain duties of his. <laughs> All the while waiting with the greatest joy imaginable for the night that was approaching. In the meantime, Pegano had returned from hawking. And after he had eaten supper, <laughs> feeling tired, he went to bed. <laughs> The lady soon followed him, and, as she had promised, left the door to the bedroom open. <laughs> and Kino arrived at the appointed hour. <laughs> and having quietly entered the room, and locked the door behind him, he went over to the side of the bed, where the lady usually slept, placing his hand on her breast. <laughs> he found that she was awake! For as soon as she felt Anikino's presence, she seized his hand with both of hers and holding it tightly, she turned and twisted about in the bed until she woke up the sleeping Egano. Then she said to him, I didn't want to say anything to you yesterday, but Egano, please, so help you God, among all the servants you have in the house, which one do you consider the best, the most loyal, the most devoted to you? What's this, wife, that you are asking me about? Don't you know who it is? There's no one I trust or love more than I do Anikino. Nor has there ever been anyone that I trusted or loved like that. But why are you questioning me about this? Hearing that the Gano was awake and that he himself was the subject of their conversation, Anikino, afraid that the lady intended to betray him, made several attempts to withdraw his hand and escape. But she was clutching it so tightly that he could not escape. <laughs> I'll tell you why, she said, replying to her husband's question. I thought he was just the way you've described him, and that he was far more loyal than any of the others. But he has undeceived me, for today, when you went out hawking, he had the gall, thinking that the time was right for it, to ask me if I would consent to yield to his desires. Wishing to avoid having to gather a lot of evidence in order to convince you of this, I decided to provide you some physical, tangible proof. So I told him I'd be happy to do it, and that tonight, sometime after midnight, I'm going to go and find him and meet him at the foot of the pine tree. Now, first, I have no intention of going there. But if you wish to find out how loyal this servant of yours is, 
You can easily put on one of my gowns and cover your face with a veil and go down there to see whether he shows up, as I am sure he will. I must definitely go and have a look, <laughs> said Egano. And after he got up, doing the best he could in the dark, he found one of her gowns, covered his head with a veil, and went out into the garden, positioning himself at the foot of the pine tree. Waiting for Anakino. <laughs> as soon as the lady heard him get up and leave the room, she got up herself and locked the door from the inside. After having experienced the worst care he had ever had in his life, <laughs> he struggled with all his might to get out of her hands while calling down under thousand courses on her and on his love and on himself for having trust her. Finally realize now what she had been doing. As soon as the lady went back to bed, she invited him to take off his clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and get in beside her. And then they spent a good long time together in pleasure and when the lady thought that the time had come for Anikino to go, she made him get up and put his clothes back on. <laughs> Sweet lips, she said. I want you to get yourself a stout stick and go down to the garden for me. Then, pretending you'd asked me to go down there in order to test me, I want you to heap abuse on Agano, just as if you thought you were talking to me. <clears throat> and after that, I want you to play a nice tune on him with your stick for me. Just imagine the amount of pleasure and delight we'll get out of that. <laughs> Anikino! went off to the garden, <laughs> carrying a little switch in his hand. Just as he approached the pine tree, Egano spotted him coming, got to his feet, <laughs> as if preparing to give him the warmest of welcomes, and walked over toward him. So you actually came here, you wicked woman, said Anikino. And did you think it was ever my intention then or now to wrong my master like this? A thousand curses on you. Then he raised the stick and began beating him. The moment he caught this outburst and caught sight of the stick, the guy started running as quickly as he could without uttering a single word. Get out of here, you evil woman, and may God damn you. I have no doubt I'm going to tell a gun about this tomorrow morning. <laughs> After he had received quite a few good ones, Egano went back to the bedroom as quickly as he could. And his wife asked him if Anikino had come to the garden. If only he hadn't. Because he took me for you and it beat me black and blue with a stick. I must say, I am surprised he had spoken to you the way he had with the intention of dishonoring me. Because I guess he, seeing how merry and sociable you were, he just wanted to put you to the test. Oh, praise God, he put me to the test with words and you with deeds. And I believe he could say that I was able to bear these words of his with greater patience than you bore what he did to you. But since he's so loyal to you, we should cherish him and do him honor. You are absolutely right. <laughs> and after he had pondered what had happened, Egano concluded that he possessed the most faithful wife 
and the most loyal servant of any nobleman. Therefore, although in future times, he and his wife laughed about the events of that night. The lady and her lover found it a great deal easier than it might otherwise have been to do the thing that brought them pleasure and delight. At least for as long as Zanichino was content to remain with the gamma in Bologna. <laughs> Eager to be made a member of a company of privateers, Maestro Simone, a physician, is persuaded by Bruno and Buffalmacco to go one night to a certain spot where he is thrown into a ditch by Buffalmacco and left to wallow in filth. <laughs> when the ladies had chatted a while about the communal sharing of wives practiced by the two men from Siena, the queen, not wishing to wrong Dionel but finding that she was the only one left to speak, began as follows. Dear ladies, Spinellotto richly deserved the prank that Zeppa played on him, and that is why, as Pampina was trying to show just a little while ago, we should not judge people too harshly who play tricks on others if the victim is asking for it or is getting his just desserts. Spinellotto got what he deserved, and now I'm going to tell you about someone who went around looking for it and whose deceivers, in my opinion, are consequently to be praised rather than blamed. The man in question is a physician who came to Florence from Bologna, all covered in beer, like the stupid sheep he was from head to toe. Every day, we see our fellow citizens returning from Bologna. This one a judge, that one a physician, yet another a notary, all sporting long flowing robes of scarlet and beer, as much as a host of other things designed to make a grand impression. And we likewise see every day just how much of this really amounts to in practice. A certain Maestro Simone da Villa was one of these four. For his patrimony was far greater than his learning. He came here uh, not all that many years ago, uh, dressed in a scarlet robe with a large herd. <laughs> proclaimed, proclaimed himself a doctor of medicine and rented a house in a street we now call Via del Cocomero. <laughs> Having just recently arrived, as I said, <laughs> this master Simone made it a practice among his many remarkable habits of asking whomever he was with to identify all the people he saw passing in the street. And he would observe and remember everything they did as though he were going to make up the medications he had to give his patients on that basis. Among those he had the most attentively, there were his neighbors, Bruno and Buffalmac. The two painters about whom we've already told two stories today. The pair of them were constantly in one another's company. And since they seemed to him to be the most carefree people in the world, and to lead happier lives than anyone else, as indeed they did. Yeah. <laughs> he made lots of inquiries about their situation, and was told by everyone that they were just a couple of poor painters. <laughs> Unable to comprehend how they could possibly lead such merry lives if they did not have much money, he concluded, having heard how clever they were, that they had to be extracting enormous profit from some source people knew nothing about. He was therefore very eager to strike up a friendship with one of them, at least, if not both, and finally managed to do so with Buffa. 
Bruno! Bruno! It only took a few meetings with uh, Mastro Simone for him to realize that he was an ass, and so he began having a grand old time thanks to his very eccentric behavior. The doctor, likewise, found Bruno's company wonderfully entertaining. Uh -huh. And he began treating him both mornings. And evenings. To the finest meals in the world. Where is our reader? From which he assumed we could talk in familiar terms. Thank you. From which he assumed they could talk on familiar terms. He therefore expressed his amazement at how the two painters could lead such merry lives without having much money and asked Bruno to teach him how they did it. <laughs> Thinking that this was another one of the doctor's usual stupid, senseless question, he began to laugh. <laughs> but then he decided to respond as is as an entity deserved. <laughs> Maestro, he replied, I wouldn't tell many how we manage it, but since you are my friend and I know you won't tell it to anyone, I won't keep it all to myself. Now it is true that the life I lead with my buddy is just as content and happy as you may think. Actually, it's even better than that. Still, we don't get enough money from uh, the work that we do or the property that we owe, not even to pay for the water that we consume. Not that I want you to think that we're a couple of robbers. No. no, no. What we do is we simply go about privateering. And with that, without harming anyone, we don't just get the necessities of lives, but also some of those little extras that give us pleasure as well. And that's, as you've noticed, it's the way that we've been able to lead such merry lives. The doctor took in everything Bruno said. And since he believed them without really knowing what he was talking about, he was filled with amazement and promptly conceived an intense, burning desire to discover what it meant to go privateering swearing to Bruno that he would never, ever, tell anyone else about it. Mm. Oh, no, no, maestro, no. Maestro, no. Well, what you're asking me to do here, it's such a serious matter that if anyone were to find out, I could end up right off the face of the earth. I could even wind up in the jaw of Lucifer at San Carlo. Still, the love that I bear for your qualitative melancity of Lignaia and the faith that I have in you are so great that I feel myself obliged to grant you every wish, and therefore I will reveal the secret to you only unto this one condition, that you swear on the cross of Montesone not to tell anyone. The doctor swore that he would not. Know then, my dulcified master, that not that long ago there was a grand master of necromancy named Michele Scotto. So called because he came from Scotland. He was received with the greatest hospitality here by many gentlemen, of whom only a few remain alive today. <laughs> When the time came for him to depart, he was urged by his entities to leave behind two quite capable disciples, charging them to grant without a moment's hesitation every wish those noblemen might have who had given him such an honorable reception. The disciples freely assisted the gentlemen I've referred to in certain love affairs of theirs as well as in other trifling matters. And after a while, having taken a liking to the city and its people's ways, they decided to settle down here permanently. They managed to form good, close friendships with a number of people, 
showing no concern for whether they were gentlemen or commoners, rich or poor, provided only that they all shared the same interests. And in order to please the friends they had made, they formed a company of some 25 men who were to meet at least twice a month in whatever place the pair selected. Once they are all assembled, each man tells them what he wants, and the two of them see about granting his wish that very night. Since Buffalmacco and I are on the most intimate and friendly terms with the pair, they made us member of the company, and we've been a part of it ever since. And let me just tell you how wonderful it is when we get together to see all the hangings around the hall where we eat, the tables set out for a king, and a noble array of servants, both men and women, <coughs> or at the beck and call of anyone in the company. And not to mention the bowls, and the pitchers, the flasks, and the cups, and all the other vessels that we use for eating and drinking, all made out of gold and silver. Oh, I can begin to describe to you the sweet sounds that we hear there from the countless instruments, nor the melodious songs. Or, or I couldn't even begin to describe to you how many wax candles are burned at those suppers, or how many are the sweets consumed, or how costly are the wines that we drink. And I wouldn't want you to think, my dear sweet pumpkin, that we show up there dressed up like you see us right now. Now, the poorest man would seem like an emperor to you, for we are all decked out, each one of us, in the finest robes and the other Binary, but over and above all these delights, there are the women from all over the world who are brought in the moment anyone asks for them. Oh, and you might recognize there the lady of the Barbaniki, the queen of the Basques, oh, and the consort of the Sultan. Mm. But also, you may recognize the Empress of Osbeck, oh, the chitter chapter of Norwega, <laughs> the semi standing of Glutonia, oh, and the, <laughs> the scapula cathedral of Narsia. Mm. But why do I go on enumerating them to you? All the queens of the world are there, I'm telling you, down to the skinky Mura of Rester John. And now, that's a sight for you. And after they've had a drink, eaten some of the sweets, well, they do a dance or two. And then each of them goes off to her bedroom with the man who <laughs> with the man who wanted her brought to him there. Oh, and let me just tell you, these bedrooms are so beautiful, you'd think you were in paradise. And they are just as fragrant as the spice jars in your shop when you're grinding the coming. Ah, and when we lay down, we do it in beds that would seem to you more beautiful than the one that Dodge has in Venice. But... <coughs> Among those who have their best time there, you've got to count Bufalmaco and I. For he usually sets swing for the Queen of Friends, and I for the Queen of England. Oh, they're two of the most beautiful women in the world, and we know how to handle them. So they don't have eyes for anyone else but us. Mm -hmm. So there, now you can decide for yourself whether we have good reason to be happier than most men as we go about our lives, considering that we have the love of two queens like that. And besides, whenever we need a thousand florins or two from them, it's because we haven't got them. Now that you know what we mean when we say going about privateering, and that in corso, just as pirates do, so do we. Except there is this much difference between the two of us. Pirates never give anything back. Whereas we return everything once we're finished with it. Oh. And now that you know what we mean when we say we go about privateering, 
you now can surely see how seriously you have to guard this secret. So there is no need for me to say anything more about the subject or to tell you not to talk about it either. The doctor believed Bruno's words as if they were truth itself, <clears throat> was filled with an intense longing to become a member of their company, as though that were the most desirable thing in the world. Accordingly, while he told Bruno that he was no longer surprised that the two of them went about as happy as could be, it was only with the greatest difficulty he could restrain himself from asking to be made a member of their company right then and there. Instead of having to wait until such a time as he had shown Bruno more of his hospitality and could plead his case with greater confidence that he would succeed. Having thus held himself in check, he began assiduously cultivating Bruno's friendship, inviting him over to eat. Both mornings and evenings. displaying boundless affection toward him. <laughs> In fact, they spent so much time with one another and got together so often that the doctor seemed incapable <laughs> of living without him. Indeed, that he couldn't even imagine doing so. <laughs> Bruno felt that he was doing pretty good, and so, no, in order not to seem ungraceful to the doctor for the hospitality he had given him, he decided to paint a figure of Lent in his dining room. An unused day over the door to his bedroom, and a urine flask over the door to his house. So if anyone would have needed a consultation from him, they would know where to go. And moreover, in a small lodge of his, he painted a battle of death, cats and uh, mice. <laughs> Which seemed to the doctor beautiful beyond description. Mm -hmm. And Bruno would sometimes say to him when the two of them had not had supper the night before, uh, last night I was with the company, and uh, since I got a little tired of the Queen of England, I said Alfred the Gumedra of the great Khan of Valtarisi. Gumedra, mm -hmm. said the doctor. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I, I don't understand these names. Oh, of course you don't, my good and simple master, for I know for sure that Hogifates and have a dinner don't say anything about it. You mean Hippocrates and Avicenna? said the doctor. By gosh, replied Bruno, I just don't know, for I'm just as bad as your name, said you are as mine. However, the name Gumedra in the language of the great Khan means the same as Empress in ours. Oh, you'd find her one really good looking gal. She'd make you forget all about your medicines and enemas and your palaces, I am telling you. Bruno went on talking to him like this from time to time until one evening when he was painting the Battle of the Cats and Mice with the doctor holding up a lamp for him. <laughs> Master Simone decided that, thanks to all his hospitality, he had Bruno sufficiently in his debt and could open up and freely reveal these feelings. Since the two of them were all alone, he said, Bruno, God knows there is no one alive today for whom I'd do all the things I'd be willing to do for you. If you asked me to go, to go from here to Peretola, I don't think it would take much to get me to do it. So, don't be surprised if I speak to you as a friend and ask you a favor in strict confidence. As you know, not so long ago, 
You spoke to me about the activities of that merry company of yours. Mm. <coughs> and it's filled me with a desire to become a member that is stronger than anything I have felt in my life. I have good reason for wanting to join, as you'll see for yourself, should I ever happen to get in. For I can assure you here and now that if I don't have them bring me the prettiest serving girl you've seen in a long, long time, you can make me the butt of all your jokes from here on. I only caught sight of her just last year at Caca Vinci <laughs> and fell passionately in love with her. And I swear by Christ's body, and I offered her ten Bolognese groats if she consent to give herself to me. But she didn't want to. And so, I am begging you, from the bottom of my heart, to tell me what I have to do in order to become a member, and to use whatever influence you have to help me get in. And I can assure you that you'll never have a better, more loyal member, nor one who will bring you more credit. First of all, I know lots of good stories and great songs. In fact, let me give you one of them right now. And all of a sudden, he started singing. Bruno had such a tremendous urge to have the tremendous portrait himself, although he managed nevertheless to do so. When the song was done, the doctor asked, What did you think of that? Well, your barbaristic canter warbling would surely put all the reeds whistle to shame, replied Bruno. You would have never believed it if you hadn't heard me yourself, said the doctor, would you? You're certainly right about that, replied Bruno. I know a whole lot of other ones. Mm? But let's let that be that for now. What you see here in me is what you get. My father was a nobleman, although he lived in the country. And on my mother's side, I was born into a family from Vallecchio. Moreover, as you might have observed yourself, I have got the finest books and the most beautiful wardrobe of any doctor in Florence. In fact, I have a rope that cost me more than a hundred lire, more than ten years ago. There. Well, having listened to him run on, Bruno was as convinced as ever that the man was a peepery. And so he decided to respond accordingly. Maestro, if you'll just uh, be patient to stay over here for a second with your robe around your neck. As soon as I'm done uh, finishing painting the tails of the mice, I will give you an answer then. <laughs> When the tales were done, Bruno pretended that he was very concerned uh, with what the doctor asked him. Maestro, what are you asking of me? <coughs> Though I know that you will do so many great things for me, and I can imagine how insignificant it may seem to a great mind like yours, it's still a great deal as far as I am concerned. Now, even if I were in the position to grant it, I wouldn't do it for anyone else but you, not just because I love you, like a friend should, but also because your words are seasoned with so much wisdom that would drive pious old ladies right off their boots, let alone make me change my mind. And the more time I spend with you, the more you seem wise to me. <laughs> and let me tell you this too, even if I didn't love you, I am bound to do so because you've fallen for such a beautiful girl as the one you described before. I must point out, however, that I don't have as much influence in this company as you think, which is exactly why I can't do what's necessary for you. But if you swear on your solemn and tainted word not to tell anyone, I can show you how you can do it for yourself. And since you've got all those fine books as long as all the other things you were talking about before, I feel certain you will succeed. 
You can speak freely, said the doctor, for if you knew me better, you know that I am very good at keeping secrets. When Messer Gasparuolo da Saliceto was serving as a judge for the Podestà for Limpopoli, there were very few things he didn't tell me, because he found me such a good secretary. And if you want proof, well, um, I was the first man he told he was about to marry Bergamina. There, what do you think of that? Well, that settles it. If a man like that confided in you, then I can surely do the same. Now, here's how we should go about it. In our company, we always have one captain and two counselors who are replaced every six months, and we know for sure that the first one of the next month, we're going to have Buffalmaco as captain and me as one of the counselors. Now, whomever becomes a captain has a lot of influence among those who get to be accepted as a member. So, in my opinion, I think that you should strike up a friendship with Buffalmaco and start entertaining him on a lavish scale. He's the kind of man that will take a real liking to you the moment he sees how intelligent you are. R. <laughs> and then, once you've moved your friendship with means of your wit as well and all the things you own, you can ask him to do it and he won't be able to tell you no. So, I already spoke to him about you, and you feel as disposed as can be. When you have done what I've told you to do, you can leave the rest of the two of us. I am really, really pleased with your plan, said the doctor. For if he's a man who takes pleasure in the company of the wise, he has only to talk to me for a while, and he'll never want to let me out of his sight. Yeah. I've got enough intelligence to supply an entire city, and I'd still remain as wise as they come. <laughs> so, um, Doctor, uh, once we've uh, put everything into place, he went to Buffalmaco and recounted the whole story in all its particulars. And Buffalmaco was so eager to provide this master Seppi had with what he was looking for that Every moment passing seemed like a thousand years to him. The doctor, who wanted more than anything to go privateering, did not rest <laughs> until he had struck up a friendship with Bufala, <laughs> which of course he had no difficulty doing. <laughs> he then began treating him to dinners, both mornings, and night to the finest to the finest meals in the world and always invite the broom to join them uh, as well the pair knowing that the man had an excellent wine cellar and many fat capons as long with a host of other good things just indulge themselves to live like lords. Uh, never needing much of an invitation to spend time in his company. Oh, reassuring him constantly that they would have done this thing for anyone else but you. <laughs> but eventually, when the time seemed right to the doctor, he made the same request to Buffalmaco he had made before to Bruno. Upon hearing it, Ufumaco pretended to be absolutely furious and blew up on Bruno. I swear by the high god of Passignano, I can barely keep myself from giving you such, such a wallop on your head that it knock your nose down to your heels. You traitor! Because you are the only one who could have revealed all these things to the Maestro! The doctor, however, did his utmost to excuse Bruno, saying that he had learned everything from another source. And after using many of those wise words of his, he finally managed to mollify Buffalmaco who then turned to him and said, Dear Maestro, <laughs> it's so clear that you have been in Bologna and that you have, be, uh, you have been keeping your mouth shut since you came back to, to this town. But let me tell you something else. You didn't, stu you didn't study medicine up there. You were really studying how to attract men to you. For what? With your wisdom and your fine talk. 
you do that better than any other man I've ever seen. Cutting him off in mid-sentence, the doctor turned to Bruno and said, What a thing it is to talk with wise men and to pass the time in their company. Who would have been able to read my mind down to the last little thought as promptly as this worthy man just did? You were not nearly as quick to perceive my true value as he was, but you might at least tell him what I said to you when you informed me that he takes pleasure in the company of the wise. Was I as good as my word? Better, he replied. The doctor then said to Buffalmatko, you would have had even more to say if you had seen me in Bologna. For there was no one there, high or low, student or professor, who didn't think the world of me, because I could keep them entertained with my wit and wisdom. In fact, I'll tell you something else. I never uttered a word there without making them all laugh. That's how much they enjoyed my company. As a result, when it was time for me to leave, they complained bitterly. And every last one of them begged me to stay, until it reached a point that to keep me there, they offered to let me alone do all the lecturing at the Faculty of Medicine. But I didn't want to, because I had already decided to come here where I have some very substantial estates that have been in my family forever. And that's just what I did. Now, what do you think? replied Bruno to Buffalmacco. And I told you what he was like. You wouldn't believe me. I swear on the Holy Gospel, there is not a doctor like him in comparison who knows more about asses as urine. And you wouldn't find his equal from here to the gates of Paris. Now, <coughs> see if you can prevent yourself from doing anything he wants. Bruno is telling the truth, said the doctor. But people don't give me the kind of recognition I deserve around here. You're all a bunch of dummies. I just wish you could see me in my natural element, among my fellow doctors. Oh, truly, maestro. Uh, you know, far more than I would have ever imagined. But therefore, speaking francastic, to use here a kind of language one should employ with wise men like yourself. Let me tell you that, without fail, I'll arrange for you to become a member of our company. Upon receiving this promise, the doctor lavished even more hospitality on the pair who enjoyed themselves enormously at his expense, persuading him to believe the most nonsensical things in the world, and the promising that he would have as his mistress, the Contessa di Crappa, who was the most beautiful lady among the whole assembly of the human race. When the doctor asked who this countess was, Ah, uh, look, maestro, replied before Marco, why she's so great, a lady, that there are few houses in the world that do not, at least to some extent, come within her jurisdiction. Indeed, even the Franciscans, to say nothing of all the others, pay a tribute to the sound of the Cotatron. And let me tell you that whenever she goes about, you'll <coughs> certainly have some sense. The word presence. Uh, although her usual residence is in uh, Laterina, mm -hmm. nevertheless, not so very long ago, she passed right by the entrance to your house, uh, making their rounds and, and get a whiff of fresh air. You can frequently see your servants making their rounds, carrying her stuff, and fail as a sign of her authority. And uh, everywhere you look, you can find their noble retainers, such as Sir Dingleberry, Lord Jord, Vicount uh, Brumhandel, Baron Squirt, <laughs> and others with whom you are intimately acquainted, even if uh, you may not recall them at the present moment. So, I think that you can forget all about that woman from uh, Cacavincini. 
because unless we are deceiving ourselves, we'll soon be in the sweet embraces of that very great lady. The doctor, who had been born and bred in Bologna, did not understand the meaning of their words, <laughs> and told them that the countess would sue them to a tea. <laughs> Nor did he have to wait very long after hearing their tall tales before the two painters were of him the news that he had been accepted into the company! Yes! 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 yes. <laughs> On the day before the next group's evening get-together, the doctor invited the pair to dinner. <sighs> And when they were finished, he asked them how he was supposed to get to the meeting. Ah, uh, uh, look, maestro, replied Buffomato, you got to be very brave tonight, because if you, if you don't, you might run into trouble and make things very difficult for us as well. Tonight, around that time, you must find a way to, to get up onto one of those raised tombs they have uh, erected outside Santa Maria Novella. Uh -huh. Make sure you wear your finest robe. So your first appearance before the company will be an honorable one, and also because the Countess is proposing, in light of the fact that you are a nobleman, to make you the knight of the bed at your own expense. So, you have to wait there until we send someone to get you. Now, so you know exactly what to expect, let me tell you that a black beast with horns on its head is going to come for you, and though it isn't particularly large, it will try by going up and down before you in the piano and make loud hissing noises and leaping high into the air! But it seems you aren't afraid. However, it will quite down and come over to you. As soon as it's close enough, however, don't be frightened or don't call no, no! Get down from the tomb and climb right up onto its back! <laughs> when you firmly sit it there, fold your arm across your chest the way carters do, and, and don't touch the beast again with your hands. Hmm? Soon it will set off at a slow pace and bring you right to us. Now, let me tell you that if you invoke God, or the saints, or show any sign of fear, the beast might throw you off, or knock you in, into something. And then you will be in a big stinking mess. So, <laughs> unless you, you are sure you'll be brave, don't come. Don't come, because you're just making trouble for us. Hmm? And not do yourself the least bit of good. don't know me, said the doctor. Perhaps you're worried about me because of the, the, the gloves and the long ropes that I wear. But if you knew what I used to do in Bologna when I went out at night with my buddies on the lookout for women, you would be amazed. 
I swear to God, I remember a night when there was one of them, a skinny gal, and what's worse, not taller than my fist, who uh, didn't want to come with us. So, after giving her a few good punches to start with, I picked her up and carried her, I think, about as far as a crossbow shot, and finally made her agree to come with us. <clears throat> then there was another night when I was all alone, except for one of my servants, and it was shortly after the Ave Maria, and I was passing by the Franciscan cemetery where they had just buried a woman that very same day, and I wasn't the least bit afraid. So, you don't have to worry on that score. I've got courage and vigor to spare. As for my making an honorable appearance before you all, let me tell you, I'm going to put on the scarlet robe I wore when I graduated. And you'll soon see how happy the whole company will be the moment they catch sight of me, and how they will be making me their captain before too long. Just wait and see what happens when I get there. After all, the Countess, without ever laying eyes on me, is already so in love with me that she wants to make me a knight of the baths. But perhaps you think knighthood won't suit me, and that I won't know what to do with it once I've got it. Well, just leave it to me. That's all very well said, replied Wolfamata. Only make sure you don't play a trick on us hmm? by not showing up or by not being there at the time when we send someone to get you. Yeah. I'm saying this because it's cold outside, and that's something you medical men are very sensitive to. God forbid, said the doctor. I'm not one of those chilly guys, so I don't really mind. In fact, uh, when I wake up in the middle of the night uh, to relieve myself, as we men do sometimes, I almost never put anything on over my doublet, except the fur gown. So, rest assured, I'll be there. <coughs> the two men left. And as night began to fall, the doctor found some excuse or other to make to his wife at home. <laughs> and, having secretly taken his splendid robe, rope, with him, he put it on. He put it on when the time seemed right. When the time seemed right. <laughs> and he made his way to the tombs. After climbing up on top, he sat down, all huddled together on the marble surface because of the bitter cold. Ufamak was tall and sturdily built, managed, managed to get one of those masks that they used to, to wear in certain festivals we no longer celebrate nowadays. And having put on a black fur gun, turned it inside out, he got himself to look up exactly like a bear, except that the mask had the face of the devil and hearts on top. But as disguised, all we knew the new piazza, with Buffal Marco following right behind him <coughs> to see what was going to happen. As soon as Buffal Marco perceived that the master was there, he began madly leaping up and down and hissing and falling and scratching like a man possessed. <coughs> <laughs> when the doctor, who was more fearful than a woman, saw and heard all this, every hair on his body stood on end, and he started shaking all over. For a moment, he wished he had stayed at home, but now that he had come so far, he forced himself to buck up his courage. So great was his desire to see all the marvels the two painters had told him about. After Buffalmaco had ranged around in the manner described for a while, 
he walked up to the tomb where the doctor was seated and became finally to a stop. The doctor was shaking all over and could not make up his mind whether to climb up onto the beast or to stay put. Finally, scared that it would hurt him if he did not get on its back, the second fear drove out the first. And, having slid down from the tomb, he mounted the beast, saying, God help me, under his breath as he did so. Once he was securely seated, he folded his arms across his chest in a courtly manner, just as he had been told to do. Bufarnaco slowly walked on all fours onto the direction of Santa Maria della Scala, bringing the doctor almost to the nunnery at Ripoli. In those days, there were ditches in these quarters where farmhands would pour their offerings to the Contessa di Grappa in order to enrich their lands. Reached the spot, Bufarnaco slowly brings the doctor to one of the edges the ditch, and choosing his moment, puts his hand under one of the doctor's feet, used it to hurl him off his back, and push him into the ditch head first. Then he started raging ferociously, leaping up, up and down as man possessed, and he made his way back to Santa Maria de la Scala, to the meadow of Ogni Santi, where he finally met with Bruno, who had left the scene because he could not keep himself from laughing. And after the two of them had pat each other on the back and leap, they watched from the distance what the filth spattered doctor was going to do. Finding himself in such a loathsome place, the doctor struggled to his feet and tried to climb out. It kept falling right back in one place or another until he finally managed to extricate himself from it. <laughs> Grieving and miserable, he stood there covered in filth from head to toe and not knowing what else to do, he walked back to his house where he knocked on the door again and again and again until he was finally let in. Once he had entered the house, <laughs> think it all over, and had the door shut behind him, Bruno and Bufamaco should have to hear what kind of welcome the maestro would get from his wife. And when they stood up there listening, they heard her giving him the worst tongue lashing any wretch ever received. <laughs> well, it serves you right, she said. Went to see some other woman and wanted to make a big impression wearing your scarlet robe, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> washing himself from head to foot. And she did not stop tormenting him until well into the middle of the night. The next morning, Bruno and Ufalmaco painted their body where the clothes were supposed to cover them in order to make it seem so as if they'd been given a beating, after which they went to the doctor's house, where they already found him up and about. From the moment they set foot inside, oh, they were greeted by a oh. foul stench coming oh. from everything. There had not been time enough to clean it all up and get rid of the smell. When the doctor was told 
and they had come to see him, he went to greet them, bidding them a very good morning. By way of response, they glared at him in anger as they planned to do. We can say the same to you, they replied. Quite the contrary, we swear and hope on God that you get years and years of misery and that you get your throat cut because you are the most disloyal, virus, traitor, and alive! And although we did everything we could to make you feel entertained and honored... Uh, it's no thanks to you that we are we barely escaped being killed like a couple of dogs. And thanks to your treachery. <clears throat> yes, we, we punched so many times last night that you could, that could have driven an ass from here to Rome with fewer blows. And we were also in danger to being kicked out of the company that we'd arranged for you to join. You want a proof? Okay. And so they showed their chest to him, showing all the bruises that they had painted all over. And then they hastily covered them up again. The doctor attempted to apologize and to tell him about his misfortunes and about how he had been tucked into a ditch. But Buffalmaco broke in with, I wish he'd throw you off the bridge into the Arno. Why did you call on God and the saints? Hmm? Did, didn't we warn you beforehand about that? I swear to God, said the doctor, I didn't know such thing. What? Replied Bufalmaco. You weren't thinking about them? Listen, here's something you should really remember. The man we sent for you told us you were shaking like a reed and had no idea where you were. Anyway, from this moment, we are going to give you precisely the kind of honorable treatment you deserve. The doctor pleaded with them to pardon him, doing the best he could to mollify them and beg them not to shame him. But out of fear that they would make him into a public laughingstock, from that moment on, he treated them to dinners. <laughs> Treat them to dinners. Ah. And, 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 and pampered them in even more lavish ways than he had ever done in the past. So now you know how wisdom is learned by those who did not learn that much of it in Bologna. 